Welcome to tonight's webinar. Um, thanks to you all for joining. We're delighted to have two really good coaches join us tonight. Um, we're joined by Manisha Taylor, MBE, who is the lead foundation phase coach at QPR in the academy, so primarily working with boys of a, of a younger age. Manisha is also an education worker for Show Racism, the Red Card, and a company director of Swagalicious Limited. We're also joined by Kat Brown, who is the assistant director at Dorking Wanderers Academy, and Kat is also an FA coach mentor. So we're really delighted to have you both with us tonight. And um, the first question that we'll put to you both is just if you could give us a bit more insight into your role and your pathway so far and your career so far, just to give everybody a bit more background. Um, Manisha, perhaps we could come to you first. Yeah, so um, my current role is um, Foundation Phase Leader at QPR and uh, that involves me overseeing the Foundation Phase and working with our, working with the, um, our Head of Coaching, our Technical Director and um, the, the coaching staff that we have. But I also coach in the YDP and my role's evolved over time and I'll, I'll kind of just explain how that's happened. So. I, I don't come from football first, I come from um, primary school teaching. So I worked in teaching full time for 10 years before I took the career change, which was purely based on um, kind of emotional ties uh, from personal circumstances. I became a young carer 22 years ago when, um, when I was 18 with my family for my twin brother. So that, that kind of had a lot to do with the decision in me um, kind of moving and embarking upon um, football, which uh, which is something that my brother and myself um, had a passion and love for. But my experiences in in education lend it lended themselves towards me it, working in my current role. So through the kind of journey from me taking a career change to when I got the role at QPR, which was in 2016, I had many different many different experiences and many different roles so um it, I was grassroots coaching um to help me towards my b license i was volunteering at lots of different clubs i was doing pba cover supply teaching um but I, I was still um then teaching the standalone subjects so like more around diversity education and mental health um then set up my set my company to freelance through that and spent a lot of time um, kind of just learning and seeing where seeing where it would take me, whether that was going to be um, looking at an education role within football. Um, and that's when I linked up with Alex Welsh, who introduced me to John Bayer. Um, and I met with John Bayer, who invited me to Arsenal to have a look at how they work. And I was still, it was still going through my head on, OK, well, what types of jobs could I do in football, which is where Alex Welsh was great in terms of mentoring and helping navigate my journey. Um, Things kept drawing me back to coaching um, and I love working directly with the players and I love being with the kids and, and I love the 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 trans you know the fact that I can transfer skill set. So I met Chris in 2014 originally and um, at the time Middlesex was folding. So I worked at Middlesex at the Girls Centre of Excellence as a coach and then my last season I became centre manager, which was Okay, it was more strategic and overseeing overseeing the centre as opposed to coaching. And Chris Chris and I spoke. He wasn't at QPR at the time. And it was very much an informal conversation around, oh, what do you do? And you know, and I asked about what it's like in a football club. And the bottom line was was that he said you needed a B license in any case, um, as as the bare minimum um, requirement of qualification to work in an academy. So off I went, just you know did what I needed to do, got my B license and met him again in 2016 at another event. So again, we had, we had another conversation and this time he asked me what I was up to and what I was doing. And Middlesex were folding. So it was a time where in the female game, there was a restructure. So we didn't become a regional talent club an RTC. And I was actively actually looking for jobs in an RTC. But Chris said to me that, look, I haven't got any jobs. And he was very honest, but you can come in and volunteer. And that was it. I just I grabbed it with two hands and I thought, gosh, you know, this is somebody who actually wants to give me an opportunity to have a look at what it's like in an academy. i would never experienced that before. I never had somebody who was so welcoming and opening um, to an opportunity like that. 
So I took it with two hands and was there all the time. I'd be there at 10, I'd watch the 18s, I'd watch the 23s, I'd watch the 23 games. I'd look at s and I'd, you know, speak to all, all the other departments around how they work and interlink, just to allow me to become more knowledgeable around what an academy, how an academy functions, um, what different departments there are within an academy. And then I'd stay back in the evening to watch the uh, school boys train. That was then helping me uh, better understand the philosophy of the club, what Chris wanted and how he wanted us to coach. And four months later, fortunately for me, so this was me doing 20 hours of volunteering for, for about four months and doing five, six other jobs um, to take a risk with the view of, let me see where this goes, you know. Um, and then fortunately, it, the, uh, positioning came up as a part-time coach so I worked with the under nines for two seasons still volunteered with other age groups and then through the ECAS program I was not I was unsuccessful the first time round before joining QPR thankfully successful the time where I was at the club and the club asked if I would if they you know if they applied on my behalf would I be interested and the funding and the support from the ECAS helped to fund my full-time role as foundation phase lead and then where my jobs evolved is it's really just an opportunity and, and being in the environment, Chris and Alex were able to see what else I could offer. So my role now, is, as well as foundation phase lead, my responsibilities also involve um, assisting Chris with the admin part of his head of coaching role, um, helping um, organise CPD, helping, you know, Alex Carroll with any, any, any other jobs around um, other departments within um, within the academy which is great for me because you know coming from my last role being a deputy head that it's this type of role is actually operations it is definitely one that I enjoy um, and I also get to work with the school boys in the evening so it's a for me it's a win-win it's great you know it, it's great because I love working with the kids and I also get to do that as well. Kat I'll probably come over to yourself now if that's all right with, with you know the same type of question just if you could give us a bit more detail on your current role and your pathway in and I'm sure some of those themes that Manisha's raised I'm sure that you've encountered them as well right? Yeah definitely um slightly different sort of path in but I've definitely experienced similar um you know similar things um so yeah my 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 current role is with uh Dorking Wanderers Football Club um as the uh, assistant director at the academy um, so basically we're, we're like a, a college program that, that runs BTEX um, and we run H&C and H&D program. Um, so my kind of role is um, the day-to-day the -day running of, um, of the academy along with uh, two other staff members. Um, so we tutor as part of, I tutor as part of the um, sport BTEC program um, and then also as a coach as a part of the full-time football environment um, sort of package that we offer as well. Um, I, you mentioned it earlier, I also work for the FA as a coach mentor um, and I used to have a voluntary role as well um, within the ladies game at um, Hampton Richmond Borough Ladies. Um, so that's currently where I am um, at the moment. Um, in terms of how I got into it, um, I, I worked in hospitality management when I finished uni. Um, I studied a, a media degree at uni, um, so both of these really relevant to what I'm doing at the moment. Um, but I think that probably speaks you know speaks quite a lot you know I, I had sort of I was in previous jobs where I was looking for maybe something else and 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 you know I couldn't quite put my finger on it um so I I actually took some time out to do some traveling um around America um and then when I got back I was doing some work around you know what 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 did I see myself doing for my life where did I want to go um and that was around uh 2015 which was the women's world cup um, where England won uh, the, the, the bronze medal um, and that was kind of it really that started sort of opening up my eyes a lot more to the, the possibility of you know I loved I always loved playing football I, I've never coached it um, and, and I sort of started to dip my toe in a little bit there um, and it just sort of really really evolved from there so I started volunteering at a, a men's grassroots club um, and then also a boys uh, youth team at Motsford, Motsford Park FC um, that kind of evolved as I sort of was completing uh, my, my FA Level 2 badge um, and I started working in a community foundation program for a few years. Um, always looking to, to sort of, you know, take the next step and get that, you know, as much experience as possible. 
um, which is where I um, cross paths with uh, Peter Augustine, um, who is um, the county coach developer um, in uh, in Surrey. Um, and he was kind of my first real mentor within the game. Um, and, and, you know, he, he gave me valuable sort of advice around, you know, getting getting experience, getting, you know, going out and seeing as much as you can and, and taking as much as you can on board with it all. Um, he actually pointed me in the direction of Dorky Mondries as well. Um, so I started off uh, two and a half, maybe three years ago, um, I think three years ago, uh, sort of volunteering and supporting with um, like midweek sessions um, of, of training in the mornings and then games. Um, but I was also I was doing that, and obviously that was voluntary. And then I was also you know balancing a um, a full time a full time role, and then I had um, uh, other voluntary roles within other grassroots clubs. Um, but the more I sort of dived into coaching at the academy, and the more I explored taking my UA for B and um, really working within the, the the coach mentor program. Um, and that's when I had uh, I, I had the great opportunity to work with Amy Price, who. Um, really kind of was a fantastic sort of support and, um, you know, really um, gave me a lot of confidence to take the next steps in my career. Um, so that that was kind of it. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've worked uh, worked uh, as many different, um, worked hard to sort of understand the, the game from as many different angles as possible and as many experiences from as many different situations, you know, teams and people as that, that I could sort of get into. Um, you know, I've, I've worked with Seven aside, nine aside, eleven aside. Um, you know, boys, girls, men, women, um, and I think all of them have, have taught me a really um, valuable sort of skill set, and they give me a you know a foundation of knowledge that you know I'm, I'm sort of comfortable to be challenged on and and, and stuff. So that, that's kind of brief, briefly it. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. And I think what that does is give everybody on the call a really good insight into obviously your backgrounds as individual coaches. But also there's some really good nuggets there that you've both brought up. I think some of the consistent themes there for us to probably all think about are our experiences as a coach. You both spoke about coaching different age groups, different sexes, different abilities and how that's helped ground you as a coach. But also not just your experiences in coaching. You know, Manisha, you've been a teacher. Um, Kat, you've worked in the hospitality industry and, and other sort of life experiences or work experiences that can add value to you as a coach. And then, of course, the role of mentors, um, which then probably starts to help form your network in the game, um, is really, really important. I think what the last couple of things I noticed you both talk about was the importance of volunteering um, and, and do sort of going over and above, whether that was, you know, doing different load of different jobs like you were doing cat at one time or you staying at the academy all day, Manisha, to learn about as much of it as you could and balancing life. And I think they're all challenges that we all resonate with as grassroots coaches, but they're all challenges that ultimately we have to work through to be really successful. So thank you for those nuggets. Really, really good start. So I guess just to move us on, I, I suppose tonight was around coaching coaching male players as female coaches. Um, so I suppose if you could give us some of your insights it's sort of into that, like challenges of coaching boys as a female coach. Have you encountered any? Is it is it a thing even? Um, is it an issue? What are your thoughts? And maybe Manisha, if we could come back to you on that one, just the challenges of coaching, you know, male players as a female coach. Yeah, um, I think from from my point of view, players are players. Um, it, whether you're a boy or a girl, it you know, it's if you, you're you're a player. Um, the only you know what I what I did notice in terms of differences were, um, you know, with regards to perceptions. So. We may we may think that it the children or the, the players notice difference. Actually, they're very naive to difference, um, and and their understanding and knowledge of that actually comes from what they see, what they hear, and um, and people around them. And actually, it's the adults that that notice it more. So when um, like when I was coaching the under 16s at FC Laysonstone at, at the when I was um, working working towards my my B license um, that being older so again I that those boys being older did did see it as a little bit bizarre that there was a female coach um, it wasn't anything that they directly said but but just by the very nature of the fact that they hadn't experienced that before but you know what after the first time I was there there was it, it was just there was you know it was it was normal 
Um, and then when I when I started to um, volunteer at at, at, the, at QPR, um, it it wasn't so much that anything was said. So with the younger players, they're very naive. Like so, they you know it's that they don't. I don't think that they notice anything. That that that's that's extremely extremely different. Um, but when I did get the job, one of the boys, the younger one, said to me, "Do you know, Manisha? I never ever thought that I would be coached by a, by a lady before." Mm -hmm. And that really made me. And I you know and I just and I smiled and I said, "Oh, well, isn't that great? Isn't that great?" And I said, "You know, you never know. Mm -hmm. There might be more." Um, and that that was you know and, and that was that. There, there was nothing. Um, there was no animosity and there was nothing negative in that. That was just pure innocence of I've never, I've never seen that before. And I think um, the environment can create that. So for me, I think that your, the perceptions are formed from within the environment and the culture that you're in. And it, it becomes, I feel it, it's more of an issue to adults than it is to parents. And, and purely, I, I think that that's not because um, people are horrible people. I think it's, it's a real lack of education and you, you kind of you navigate towards what's comfortable and, and what you know. So um, we've had we've had another female uh, academy coach who's who's um, spent some time at the academy. But at the moment, I'm, I'm the only one and that, and that that isn't because the the, the club um, are not acceptance of diversity because actually cute people that know QPR, we, we, I think but the, the statistics must come from our club because we are the most diverse club with regards to um, coaches and females across across different departments. But it, what we find is that we don't actually have many females that apply. Mm. So I, I think, you know, just in, in terms of I'm going back to you, back to the question about the, you know, the, the male players thing. I wonder if there's um, a perception around what it's like within the professional game um, and, and then thinking about the culture of what it's like in the professional game for for women and for females because it's a tough environment in any case like you have to be extremely resilient um, to, to be able to manage in, in 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 that type of environment I mean for me it was a culture shock it's very different to what I'm used to in the primary sector like primary education is female dominated um, it, you know, it's, I'm used to managing women, and then this is for me on the complete opposite of I'm managing men, and it's a completely it's a male dominated environment. And then you then you're bringing the dynamics around ethnicity, you know, and and it's um, I think that's something we can't shy away from because it's obvious that there's still perceptions and stereotypes. One around being a female coaching male players, but within a high performing environment because um, there's very few that do that. And then you're looking at the, the dynamics around the fact that you're an Indian female that doesn't even come from football, that comes from a completely different other sector who's also working in this environment. So I, I think personally that the, the, the perceptions come from culture and are more pertinent to adults as opposed to the kids. I think that the players are just naive and they just get on with it. Look, it's the older ones obviously will, will be a little bit more vocal because they're more aware, but once they once they see you and you know once you've built a rapport and you've connected with them that that goes away um so yeah from my point of view i think i think it's more more to do with the perception of adults than it is to do with the kids okay i really really appreciate that. i think again there's some really good insights i probably will come back to the like, male dominated environment piece as well with you both in a minute um but and, and you speak quite honestly there and i'm sure again we can we can resonate with what you've said around there perhaps being a difference between younger players and older players and obviously certainly adults, whether that's the parents or whether that's adult players. And I know, um, Manisha, your role at QPR is primarily aimed at the younger players, although, as you said, you work with some of the older ones. Kat, I suppose your role working with older male players predominantly than, than the, the ones that Manisha works with, do you perceive there to be, how do you perceive it at, at your end and where you're working with working with older players, how do you find the challenges of coaching those male players as a, as a female coach? Yeah, I think um, there's, I think first and foremost, you, no matter what the, you know, what the, 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 the sex of a player that you're going into coach doesn't, in some respects, isn't the most important thing. Um, you know, you, 
yes, yes, there's an element of it. Obviously, I mean, you know, when they're when they're young and at different ages, there's different challenges um, for for sure. Um, you know, I, I I work within, like I said, sort of uh, 16 to to 24 year old um, males, um, and and that's uh, you know that's a unique experience for me. Um, so you know, it's um, it, there's definitely other challenges of it, but you know, it's it's not something that I would initially kind of say. Um, you know, identify as it males or females that you want to work with. You know, it's it's go and go and experience both. And make your own kind of, um, I guess, decisions and 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 again your own experiences of it. And make your own mind up if there is. Um, you know, so my 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 personal experience um, there is that you know being a female coaching you know male as I, as I say sixteen to twenty four year olds. Um, there's many rewards. Um, uh, there's also a lot of challenges that come with it. Um, I think that you know ma males and females they can they can definitely present different challenges, but a lot of them are also the same challenges. It's the same sport, etc. You know, um, I think my social and my my sort of psychological skill set has been heavily and sort of refined and worked on from my time within the women's game, um, but then also but slightly different within the men's game. Um, you know, if I think back to when I first started working, you know, within within the males um, sort of side of the game, I had to very quickly almost um, sort of get my, my kind of confidence and authority and, and, and respect. Um, I, I had to learn to find my feet really quickly. Um, and a lot of that was just, you know, as I said, sort of being confident in in my own sort of, you know, coaching and the messages that, that I was sending as a coach. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if you're not, you know, again, I can't, can't stress that this is in, in, in my experience, but, you know, if you're not confident in what you're, your delivering and your messages, um, you know, when, when they get broken down and challenged to a point where, you know, it, it can make or break you if you can't back up what you're saying. Um, and I think at the particular age range that, that I work with, um, you know, players don't hesitate to challenge within a group situation. So, you know, if you can't, you know, clarify or justify, um, you know, you can sort of find yourself in a bit of hot water, so almost. Um, so, you know, I think preparation is key, um, you know, get yourself out there, experience as much as you can, as much as different environments as you can. And, you know, it's it's definitely it's the, it's one of the most challenging, but but by far the most rewarding kind of role that, that I've experienced within football. Um, and I suppose, you know, similarly, it's, it's I don't look at it and go, I coach males or I coach females. I think it's just, you know, I, I could probably go and, and, and find, a, you know, a, a group of females at 16 and, be presented with very similar um, sort of challenges, um, but you know e everyone's experience is different. It's, I think it's more about the group of players that you're working with, right, maybe rather than than the, the sort of sex of them. No, brilliant. I think there's again some really good insights there, and for me, you know, from what you were saying, players are players, coaches are coaches, um, but we do have in our sport some cultural and some you know perception issues and challenges to work through for our underrepresented groups whether that's females um whether that's you know female players female coaches whether that's people from bame backgrounds and other underrepresented groups there's clearly some um, some work for us to do so and obviously authorities are trying trying to make make you know headway um but there's certainly some issues to still be worked through in our sport so i think your your comments next on your challenges as females working in a male dominated environment are probably not so much just the players now, but more just, you know, we know that the majority of football club staff are male. Um, we, you know, you've both alluded to that already. Manisha, you've spoken about a primary teaching background that is predominantly a female, you know, environment to a football club environment that's predominantly male and being quite stereotypical there, but you can get, get the sort of sense of what I'm saying. Um, I guess your insights into how you find the environment of football as a female coach would be really, really good. And Manisha, perhaps again, if we could come to you on that one first. Yeah, no, it was um, it was a real culture shock for me. Um, like I said, it just, they're polar opposites with regards to the demographic. So um, when I when I joined uh, when I started to volunteer at, at QPR, that it, I think. Mine so I feel mine so multi layered. So people, I'm four foot nine and a half, and the half's really important when you don't reach five foot. <laughs> I'm sure that all the people that are listening in are over five foot, but I'm not. Um, so there's perceptions around on the back of you know what you look like, and this is just so the fact that I'm really small and I'm really petite that 
oh, she must be really young. And actually, I'll be 40 next year, next week. So uh, I, I'm coming in a lot older. Happy birthday for next week. <laughs> Thank you. That I'm, I'm almost like 50 from, from a lot, you know, some of the members of staff, I'm 10 to 15 years older uh, than a lot of them there. Um, and I'm not saying that it should make any difference with regards to age, but it's, this is just purely based on perception. So people already on the back of that um, didn't, didn't know my background, didn't know, you know, the experiences that I've had. And again, we talk about culture and judgment, and it is not to blame anybody at all. I just think that it's, it's, the things are just about a conversation and education, really. So that that you know just that initial moment was was challenging and then it's like you haven't I feel that you have to prove yourself so I have to prove myself as a person who is small in stature um to try and uh show that actually I'm resilient and I'm bold and I have tenacity and that um I can hold my ground then you're having to also prove from the point of view of um being female um with, within this environment then on top of that you're having to prove that you're actually just as equipped and knowledgeable as the coaches there. Doesn't matter that I've come from another another sector. Um, you know, I've got the same qualifications. And and if Chris, you know, Chris Ramsey didn't think that I was coachable or, or adaptable or could offer something, then anyone who knows Chris Ramsey knows that he's he's like he's strict. Anyone who knows Chris is he's strict. And um, Chris doesn't just bring anybody in, you know, he doesn't just get it. You have to be, you have to show something. And, um, you know, you, it's not about being the end product. And that certainly wasn't that, you know, wasn't like that with me. And I'm, I'm, I'm not embarrassed to say that. Um, it, I was coachable and he knew that I wanted to learn and I could offer other things from, from my previous background. So that, that helped with regards to su supporting, um, me in managing some of these dynamics and then the other thing is on the you know and then you're having to prove that actually stereotypically somebody who like who's an some you know talk about ethnic minority but it's south asian and of indian heritage there aren't i don't know any other indian women that are in the professional game so within within um within a coaching and management capacity so it on so many levels you're having to go through about five six doors before you're even getting treated with the same respect and fairness um as as as, as anybody else there and one of the biggest things for me was around how do i manage the environment like how, what what am i going to do to do that and i'm lucky that i've got someone like chris who like i said people who know him will know how he is so he he would just tell me straight up do this, do it like this, don't do that, say this, try that, this is going to work. And I'm trusting him because of his experiences and I know that he really wants me to succeed and I know that he wants to help me. Um, and then there are other mentors too, like Hope Hal, um, I, I, I speak to and Hope, you know, again, similarly, um, don't worry about that, that's not a battle that you need to fight, just ignore that, you know, that pick your battles, understand that, that, that all that type of thing. Um, so there's some there's some people that I lean on that's helping me to manage the environment. Um, and that's the biggest thing at the moment. It's about how do you when you're presented with adversities and adversities on so many levels, how do you manage the environment so that actually um, you can you can be just as success, um, successful as, as anybody out there? And the other thing I'll just say is that we and Chris, Chris got me to think about this um, yesterday, in fact, when we were talking, which is we have to change this narrative around, oh, well, you've got to be better than everybody just to get just to get a look in. Why should we actually got, I've got to be with all those dynamics, I should be treated on the same level as, as the other person who's there. That why do I have to be better? What, because I'm Indian, because I'm a woman, because I'm small, because I haven't played the game at a pro level, because I come from a different sector, that we need to change this narrative around, um, again, perceptions and culture and the fact that you shouldn't have to always be thinking that you have to prove yourself. And I'm still there. I'm still feeling that I've got to prove myself and I've got to be better. Whereas 
I'm now think, reflecting and thinking about what he said, which is actually I need to change the way that I need to ch help change that narrative by actually changing my thought process. And, and, and instead of saying, I've got to be better. No, I just want to be treated with the same fairness as everybody else. And I will work hard to manage those adversities, but I shouldn't be treated any differently because of them. Absolutely. And there's some really, really valid points there. I think we've still got a lot of work to do around education. Um, and that's a, a key point that you raise education for, for all market segments of our game on this whole wider issue and education for society around how we are so quick to judge and so quick to use perceptions before understanding the wider context or understanding the person. Kat, I'd be interested in, in your thoughts on on the matter as well in terms of your experiences in working in this sport which as we know is predominantly a male dominated environment where what are your thoughts yeah i think um what working in a male dominant environment is is um is definitely a challenge you know it's um there's uh, there, there's no denying that at all um i think personally um i've lost count at the number of times that i've gone to an away game for example and and been greeted as the the physio or been greeted as a you know a mum who's there to to support her, her son you know not a daughter but a son who's there obviously playing football um you know so there's there's definitely that element of it um in in um, within the game um it's it's something that i think is overlooked and it's not sometimes maybe um you know discussed as 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 much um, and I think there could definitely be a lot more discussions and awareness around it um, you know I'm, I'm really really fortunate that um, you know I get to work with some fantastic people who you know are who, who are really supportive have always supported me and and I suppose had um, you know had my back with situations um, you know the, the academy director at Dorking um, Jordan um, Pete, Pete Augustine as I mentioned before as a, as a mentor both of those are really you know fantastic in terms of you know, being that that confidence to you know go back out onto the pitch and you know beat beat the manager who's just directed me to the physio room. Um, but you know, it's it's definitely it's important to challenge the stereotypes a hundred percent. You know, but it's it's challenging them in the correct way. I think is also a challenge. You know, if you if you sort of go in and you start kicking up a fuss and you know you be dramatic, oh you're the you know you're the dramatic coach and that's also a stereotype and and you know something that's a challenge as a female as well. Um, I think personally, I've, you know, I found myself sort of a, a firm but sarcastic comment around asking them if, you know, they're the physio of their team or something. Um, you know, you sort of get a firm, a firm tongue in, uh, tongue in cheek humour usually gets, you know, an embarrassed apology. Um, but it's definitely a stereotype that need, needs to change. Um, you know, that sort of presuming that, you know, I can't possibly be there to coach or manage, you know, male players. Can't, can't possibly. Um, and it's frustrating. Um, it's, it's something that, you know, I, I don't forget each time I experience it. Um, you know, if someone even shakes my colleague's hand who who's a male, but but you know, or, or a co-coach who's a male, but but they don't shake my hand. Um, you know, that that happens a lot. <laughs> that that happens mm -hmm. a lot, even when I do work within the women's game, unfortunately. Um, and you know, similar things. You know, I, I want to be treated the same. Um, you know, because of you know, sort of be, being a coach, not not differently because I'm a female. Um, and I think awareness and having conversations around those sorts of things are, are definitely important. No, again, massive, massive points raised there and, and education and stereotypes is really at the heart of what we're talking about. So no, thank you for your insights. Um, we're just over halfway for all of the coaches listening. So just a reminder um, to pop any questions in the chat function. And if we get some time at the end, we'll try and address them. But there's been some really, I'm sure there has been some thoughts from the coaches listening in. Um, so feel free to, to pop into the chat. I'm just keen to move us on now into um, a theme that you've both brought up and it's around the theme of volunteering um, and how volunteering has almost helped you as a coach. Um, so I don't know if you could you know, give us some of your insights on the value of volunteering, how it's helped and the different types of environments you've volunteered within um, and just sort of really generally and broadly sort of your experiences as a volunteer, how that's helped you in your career. Um, Manisha, if we can come to you first. Yeah, um, I found that volunteering has helped me from like my initial stages in where do I want to go in, you know, in, in a career. So even before I started my teaching, um, my teaching degree, we were with a 
you know, there were opportunities um, to, to kind of go into schools and just see what things were like. And then when I was on my teaching degree, again, you know, as part of you, you went on, on, on placements. But just through my whole journey, I guess from then to, to now, the volunteering opportunities have just broadened my horizons on what else is out there. Um, it, when, when, when you want to learn a little bit more about different environments and settings, it's, it's definitely allowed me, allowed me to do that. And I think everything's down to choice. So if ever, you know, you're in a position where you feel, hold on a minute, I think people are taking a little bit, you know, of advantage over my generosity in time. You, you're, you've got, in, in some respect, you could, you know, you're not getting paid. Um, it's having the confidence to be able to, to kind of speak up and say, look, you know, I've, I've been, I've been doing X, Y, and Z. And, and sometimes it's, it's a, it's a, Thank you for your thank you for your time and you move on and and sometimes it isn't and like I, I've I've done so many different types of jobs purely based on the fact that when I took the career change I still wasn't quite sure so I really enjoyed writing and um, I was volunteering for the Asian Today which is a local um, Asian newspaper and I was writing my own column um, and I did that for about nine months um, and it gave me the opportunity to. At that point, it was do I want to go in? Do I want to do an NCTJ? You know, I, people seem to, to like what I'm writing. Do I want? I just didn't know. I, I volunteered um, on, a, on an online TV show when I was presenting. Never done that before. Well, as in, I presented with when it comes to stuff like this, or, you know, I'm used to speaking in, in assemblies and large groups. And when you're having to, you know, do speak in front of governors and HMI and people like that. But no, not not as in, oh, you've got your own show and you're just going to, you know, present. But that was a fantastic experience. And all of these things, I mean, even, you know, obviously the, the, the volunteering at coaching clubs, um, at football clubs, that it different. It's about, I think, take, taking different elements from different things. So, you know, it as opposed to, oh, it's that job. So one of the things that I, you know, that I took, for example, from, um, the media wrangle was I built connections. Um, I, I became it de developed my confidence in how I speak and how I articulate myself. Um, it it then gave me it opened up opportunities into coaching through the connections that I made. Um, I still keep in contact with people. So if there's certain things from my own from my own work outside of QPR that I might want to media or PR and stuff like that, that I've got people that I can now lean on and say, oh, you know, look up create this mental health project can you come in and help with that and so I think you know this the game is about connections and it's about who 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 can you connect with to, to help you along the way and don't let's not just restrict that to coaching even if you it is that you want to be a coach because the world of football, as we know, like we talk about multidisciplinary, it is like that. And there's so many interdependencies and, and links between areas and subjects that some, you know, down the line, you'll meet somebody that you met in a completely different field, um, you know, whether it's support science, media, medical or whatever it might be. So, you know, like, like I think the volunteering for me, like I said, is definitely um, helped me mould and develop into in, into the the person I am and, and the experiences that have given me of are helping me in my roles now. That's really really powerful, and I and I know that will resonate with many coaches on the call who are likely to be volunteers, volunteer coaches, probably with other day jobs at the same time. And I think um, you know what you said there is, is certainly going to be of of note to them and, and to really support support them and where they you know where they are at as volunteers as coaches as well on kind of what a reminder to them of what they are getting even though sometimes it might seem really hard out coaching in the rain when you've had a, a full day at work cat what about your experiences in, in volunteering how's that helped you um yes yeah, so similar similar sort of stuff to to manisha um i wouldn't be the coach that that i am um you know today without the hours of volunteering that, that i put in um you know you, you you definitely can't expect you know just walk into a role you know with a coaching badge if you've got no experience on the grass or or even sort of you know off the pitch with regards to even just like organizing and, and actually understanding what it takes to 
sort of manage a team or what it takes to organise a club. You know, it's um, I think until you start sort of, you know, put, put, dipping your foot into those sorts of, you know, parts of, of football, it, it really opens your eyes to some of the amazing work that, that volunteers do. Um, you know, I think I've volunteered over probably five different clubs over the last few years um, and probably 10 different teams and roles um, within those clubs. Um, I think it's a great way to build up your confidence. You know, obviously networking is, as Manisha said as well, um, it's an opportunity to show your worth as well. Um, you know, some of um, some of the most amazing and, and sort of trusted people within my network have, have come from, you know, roles that I was, you know, volunteering in. Um, to, to, to kind of the, the, the biggest club that, that I was involved in was um, was Motspur Park FC. Um, you know, at one point I was I was starting up their kind of um, you know their girls teams. I was running wildcat sessions. I was managing and coaching my own team. I was a welfare officer. Um, you know, that it's that that that's a, that that could be a full time job in some respects. You know. Um, but whatever I, you know, whatever I could get into, um, you know, that would benefit and, and grow the club, and you know, um, sort of learn or help me to learn as as a figure in football, not just as a coach, but understand the game as a welfare officer and, and what's required, you know, to, to do that. What's required to, yeah, coach and manage a team, but what's required to set up a team from, you know, from nothing. Um, I think I. What one of the one of the most fondest memories I'll have, um, you know, for, for for a very long time is, you know, I started an under ten girls team um, at, at Mossman Park, um, and I think I was, you know, it was one and two players that were showing up for the first probably month um, of, of that team, um, and you know they 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 progressed, was with them for for a few years, and you know, and it, one of the most fondest sort of journeys I think I'll probably ever have in football was was my time that I volunteered and. Sort of helped to, to you know build and set up that team and, and and progress them and you know it's it's it was really fantastic really really rewarding um but it's definitely you know the the opportunities um you know to learn that i took have helped me progress into the paid roles that i have now um you know even now i have two paid roles but i still volunteer hours and hours of my time within you know the women's game because that's my you know maybe my area of development i want to learn more about you know more more about that side of it um, so I take the time to um, to, to do that, um, but you know I wouldn't have I wouldn't have my job at Dorking if I hadn't have, have started volunteering and, and showed my willingness, showed my worth, you know, showed my passion. If I hadn't have done those things, and um, you know, really similar with, with other opportunities and stuff, it's it's um, it's yeah, it's, it's a it's something I can't I can't recommend um, I can't recommend enough, um, and and um, you know get out and it's it's a really rewarding thing if you can support and you know help grassroots teams essentially really kind of take on and build i think it's a, a fantastic opportunity for, for coaches to learn no brilliant i think there's some really good insights there into the value and the power of volunteering both from a community piece and being part of something um but also you've both spoken about the development of your own skill set through volunteering um and Kat, i quite like the way that you articulated how that has helped you secure the paid roles um, and the job, which is, again is something that we don't necessarily consider so much within coaching. I think it's probably fairly well recognised that to forge a career in this field as a coach, whatever background you are from, um, you, you'll most likely have to go and do some volunteering and go and learn your craft and go and develop that skill set. Um, as I say, whatever background, I know that was the same for me as a white male and you guys have said it was same for you as well so really really interesting and powerful um we did say we finish at eight o'clock like any sort of proper coaching session and, and hand everybody back uh, there's a couple of questions i just want to finish off on and i'm trying to cover all the questions that the audience have sent in either before or during this chat so i guess the next one for me is just we read more and more now around diversity um whether that's you know cultural diversity whether that's BAME females males etc and there's more being written now about sort of cognitive diversity more broadly and just you know that different people from different backgrounds can actually add value I guess the question to you both is does we've acknowledged that football has a lack of diversity on many levels um, but does a lack of diversity actually limit the opportunities for the players so these players are engaging in a, in a world that isn't particularly diverse, really broadly and generally speaking. 
um, does that limit the opportunities for them to develop their skill set as players? And maybe Manisha again, if we could just come to you first on that, does a lack of diversity limit opportunities for players? I think that it's, it, I think you've got to look at, first of all, um, where's the club situated? So sometimes it, there could be a lack of diversity because of where the club is. And ultimately, what we want to happen is that the demo, we want the players to be represented of the demographic that the club is situated in. Now, if yeah. if that isn't as it is, and if, if that is, you know, if, if, if it isn't, then, then you've got to ask the question, okay, why is that? So if it is a case of actually it's the, this club is situated in a really diverse area, but the players are not representative of that, then we've got to look at, okay, is it down to recruitment? Because ultimately the players come in through, through recruitment, don't they? That, that's, how, that's how the players come in. And then in the broadest sense of recruitment, it's what's the recruitment policy? Um, it, it, again, is this, are there un I think unconscious bias is a massive thing. So uh, uh, it does there need to be further education around unconscious bias and stereotyping, um, perceptions around what players should look like. So, you know, like typically it was always the, oh, well, if you've got, you know, uh, like a, a tall kind of, um, a tall black player, for example, who's, um, you know, got a little bit more build while well, he's just going to be a centre half or he might be a striker, let's just put him down there. But he's not going to be like the, the number 10 who's able to, you know, He's got good agility, able to drop a shoulder and, you know, able to manipulate the space. Um, There's the, the stereotypes around Asian players and South Asian players and, and, you know, and eating habits and things like that. So these stereotypes do still exist. And I think that we can't come away, come away from those conversations that they do. But what we also have to look at are um, good examples. So I'll go back, not just because I work at the club, but it... The QPR are represented, uh, sorry, the players that we have at the academy represent the demographic of, of the area. Now, some people may say that, oh, well, but West London's quite diverse and you still probably need to have more diversity among the players. But we, we also have to then look at the pool. So, you know, with regard to the pool of players that you have that are of a certain level or um, have the potential to be developed, then you've also got to look at um, that younger players rely on their parents in order for them to get to training. So then I'm talking, you know, we're looking at the, the, the situation, the, where does, where is the club located? So the, if, if the club is, most clubs are, are located in the sticks, where actually it's really difficult to get to unless you have a car. A, a lot of the clubs, you'd have to probably get a train, a bus, two buses, and then walk. It's not a case of, oh, well, you've got a train station that's just down the road, you know, or you've got a bus stop that's right outside and just one bus is going to take you take you to your house and back. You know, that, that that's not the case. So, and the other thing I'd add as well is, sorry, it's just that then it's, you know, it, it's, you've got to also look at the philosophy of your club. So what's, the, you know, and the philosophy then links to, I guess, li definitely links to recruitment. So if you've got a philosophy at the club that is, um, that is guided by the premise of um, we'll take the player that that we feel, regardless of any difference, regardless of any individual difference, that we feel this player has potential. We we feel that this player, you know, is is what we're looking for with regards to our club philosophy. That, that's that's what you want to get to, you know. And like I said, and it needs to re be representative of the demographic. But there's so many other factors that need to be considered around it that I don't think it's a, it's a case of that oh this club isn't representative and therefore we we suggest that they're doing things that are wrong i think well you've also got to look at like i said i mentioned about location and other factors that contribute to that and that's a whole excuse me that's a whole can of worms just on its own about what the location of the where these clubs are and how do you you know okay what do we do about that yeah, I think the, the point of clubs being representative of the communities that they serve is massively valid. And if the, you know, if the clubs aren't, then there's sort of some digging to be done as to why that might be the case. Because I think, as I sort of said, the, the sort of emerging research is around the fact that diversity is, is beneficial. 
um, whether that is ethnic diversity, as I said, males, females, etc. Kat, what are your thoughts on it? It's probably probably our last question of the night, um, so no pressure. But what are your <laughs> thoughts on it? Does a sort of lack of diversity in our sport limit limit those opportunities, especially for players? Um, I think I think yeah. Um, coming coming from a, I guess I'll, I'll go from a different sort of angle. Um, the the, the minutia there. Um, I think from personally from if I, if I think about my my current environment that I work in. Um, if if um. And again, you know, relating to, to being a female, um, being the only female there, you know, for a teenage lad who who's not had a positive female role model in their life for, you know, for, for whatever reason, um, to come into a full time environment with with a female sort of leading them um, can definitely be a challenge. You know, it's, it's it, again, you'd have to sort of breaking down those the sort of stereotype that, you know, of, of what our relationship or our interactions are going to be like and. You know breaking that down and then rebuilding it and and, and stuff um but it, wor- it works the other way as as well you know um i think you know our, our lads or any kind of you know players they, they go from sort of comfort zones um you know of a training pitch and then they come into a space that they maybe they aren't as relaxed in um which is you know within the classroom and and, and stuff like that where where we work with them um and that can sometimes be a challenge for sure um so you know i, th- I think if they if they haven't experienced it before they come into football it's or in, into our you know education program um it's it's definitely a a challenge to you know open up their their, their kind of thoughts and, and pose questions and you know really raise um you know awareness of you know obviously i've said we, we work a lot in, in we work within education as well as football so you know we, we're heavily sort of aware and, and raising awareness every single day around the British values and you know around you know equality and social understandings and tolerances you know so it, it's something that we actively you know we really do try to you know sort of address on a daily basis or you know even to a point I suppose where it's you're not even addressing it it's just part of the culture and the environment that you're accepting of you know of others views and you know of others um you know kind of sort of backgrounds and stuff and, and where they come from um but 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 yeah I think um I think it can you know if, if you don't come across positive like I said male or female you know females within within your life especially at the young ages as you progress through and you get into a teenage year it's um can definitely have an effect for sure um so yeah brilliant thanks Kat and um I am conscious of time I suppose I'm just going to take a couple of minutes now to just wrap up there's been there's been so many themes that you've raised, both of you, throughout the, the call tonight. So thank you so much. And we could have probably done a series of webinars with you, you both on the on the themes that you've brought up. Um, so massive thank you. Um, a massive thank you to all the coaches that have logged in tonight. Um, my little sales pitch is that we will be continuing to run webinars such as this. So do please keep an eye out via our social media feeds. Um, the other thing to say is that Previous webinars and and this one as well are uploaded to our YouTube channel. So our intention is to have a suite of resources there for coaches that even if you can't make the calls or, or of an evening that you can go back and re-listen. Um, and even for you guys as coaches that have logged in tonight, if there's as I said so many nuggets of information there from Manisha and from Cat, if there's something you want to re-listen back into, you can do that via our, our YouTube channel as soon as we've uploaded the footage. Um, Massive thanks to Manisha and Kat in particular. Thank you so much for giving up, you know, your evenings to come and talk to everybody tonight. It's been really, really good. As I say, we could have done a, a whole series of stuff. So thank you so much. Thanks to all of the coaches that dialed in and all of the coaches that are listening to this offline via via YouTube or something. Um, thanks to everybody. Take care and we will see you all soon.